good to see all of you in your little Zoom boxes on this uh, cold evening here in, uh, in March. Um, so a few weeks ago when I started to think about uh, this talk, um, the news was filled with reports of, uh, of the Freedom Convoy, uh, a group of activists uh, who had taken over uh, part of downtown Ottawa in protest of the uh, coronavirus mandates. And um, I wanted to talk about our obsession with freedom, um, not just in the United States, actually, but also in other parts of the free world. And then uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and the world stopped to bear witness and to send our support to people who are actually fighting for freedom uh, from the tyranny of a brutal dictator. So I'm still going to talk about um, freedom, the original talk that I had in mind, um, but I wanted to uh, actually take a moment for us to just pause and reflect on what's going on in Ukraine. Um, so just um, just take a moment, if you would. So freedom. What feelings does the word invoke in you? What thoughts that is, does it invoke in you? Abstractly, we might say there's, uh, there's freedom from and freedom to. There's freedom from hunger and from oppression. There's freedom to marry who we want, to be treated fairly in the workplace and in society. There's freedom of thought and freedom of expression. People can be very threatened by certain types of expression. But I think in this country, we most often hear the word um, freedom uh, being invoked in the world of politics. Um, now, I know a lot of people tell me they hate politics, and I know what they mean. Um, but I like to remind myself that politics is simply the way that people living in groups make decisions. That's actually what the word means. And so we can lament what has become of our politics, but the need to make decisions about how we live together is as old as civilization itself. Now, there are many ways in which freedom applies on a personal level. Um, we can and should seek to free ourselves from oppressive relationships or employment if we find ourselves in those situations. Uh, and in the political and economic spheres, we should advocate against prejudice and police brutality and sexual abuse and voting rights. We should support voting rights. But I want to return to another aspect of this phenomenon, the obsession we have with freedom uh, in the political sphere today, which is very easy to miss. And it's the very human experience and human emotion, which is at the core of how people respond to these issues. And to, to bring this up, I'm just going to read a little excerpt um, from an article I read in the New York Times on February 19th. Um, the title of the article was The Giddy, Terrifying Siege of Ottawa. So this is going back a few weeks. And the reporter wrote, most people I met said they'd never been to a protest before. Their willingness to not just go to Ottawa, but in many cases to stay there in the freezing cold for weeks on end is a sign of how profoundly the pandemic has eroded trust in the authorities. Two years of COVID has created a climate of suspicion, confusion, and grief that the far right has been able to exploit. Imad Araj, who installs HVAC systems and helps his wife run an Ottawa hunting and fishing shop, was at the protest on Tuesday night with a cousin. He said, it did a lot of damage of the speaking of the pandemic restrictions. 
me myself, I'm sitting home, I'm feeling so down because of all these friendships that you used to have to get together for a card game or whatever. It's no longer there. We disconnected from each other. He spoke bitterly of the 10 person limit on indoor gatherings in Ontario over the winter holidays. We used to have a lot of people at our house. My brothers, my sisters, my mom came to visit, he said sadly. Before the Freedom Convoy came to Ottawa, Araj said he'd never taken part in a demonstration. I was depressed sitting at home. I thought I was alone. I thought I was going crazy. I thought I was the only person thinking that way, he said. And then when, and then when this happened, I came down to see. And what he saw uplifted him. Araj said, the love that you'll receive here you are never, ever going to see it anywhere else. So this has fascinated me. And what I hear in this account is suffering and a desire for the end to suffering. I hear a desire for community, for Sangha. I think it's difficult still for us to truly understand how the last two years have affected us. Kind of like living, uh, like being a frog in a pot of water over a flame. Uh, the world has changed and we changed with it. But we don't know that for some of us, the water became so hot, we lost the things that ground us. Loved ones, livelihoods, homes, communities. Now, I think those of us who are aware of what's going on in the news know that the anger of the people attending these rallies uh, is misdirected. We know that there are right wing activists who are exploiting people's emotions. In fact, most truckers in Canada are vaccinated and don't like the way this movement has portrayed them portrayed them. Uh, we know that people have legitimate reasons to be cynical about the government and politicians, but Actually, when we look a little more closely, I think we also see people who are struggling and taking a stand, however misguided it might be, to make the world a better place. Most of these people are probably people I would want as a friend if I needed help. Now, the language they use or are manipulated into using is the language of freedom. But underneath it all, maybe we're also hearing about this because there's a spiritual vacuum in people's lives. And when life gets difficult, not having a spiritual center is devastating. So how do we handle the difficulties in our lives? And I think I think we're all very fortunate. We have this practice, we have this Sangha. We have our teachers and our teachings. And so when I was reflecting on this question, how do we handle the difficulties in our lives? It occurred to me is that what we do is we, we take refuge. We take refuge in the three treasures of Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. And taking refuge is both an act of faith and it's a vow. We commit ourselves to waking up and we have faith that we can awaken. And then this commitment sets us on the path to freedom, true freedom. Now, you know, saying we take refuge, I, I think it kind of conveys the sense that we're going to a place where we, we're protected from the vicissitudes of life, from all of the ups and downs. But I think we all know that Zen doesn't promise some sort of la la land of, of fluffy bunnies and, uh, and daffodils. Uh, rather, our practice is such that um, whatever we encounter in our lives, we vow to meet it. We vow to drop our ideas and our conditioning to just be present. We vow not to turn away from suffering whether it's our own suffering or that of others, but to meet it. So taking refuge doesn't mean we won't feel sadness or pain. They're inevitable. But by being aware of our reactions to sadness and to pain, 
the mental formations that arise in any situation. We see when our reactions have a tendency to make matters worse for ourselves or for others. And we refrain from doing that. Or we make an effort to refrain. Or we atone for our actions when they cause harm, which they inevitably will because we're human. When I first started practicing Zen, I, I was actually sitting with the Rinzai group. Um, and do, during every service, we, we took refuge. Um, we chanted, um, Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangam Saranam Gachami I take refuge in Buddha. I take refuge in Dharma and I take refuge in Sangha. So what is Buddha? Mind is Buddha. So when we're talking about Buddha, of course, we say that Buddha is both the historical Buddha, but it's also the awakened nature in ourselves, in each of us. And when we sit, we reconnect to that aspect of ourselves the aspect that observes the world and our reactions to the world. Buddha's there when we notice the spring flowers coming up and without thinking we smile. We see ourselves reacting perhaps in joy, perhaps in anger, and we take a deep breath. A monk asked Nansen, how can I see into my true nature? Johnson replied, that which sees into is your true nature. The Dharma, of course, is both the Buddha's teachings, and it's also the teaching offered by everything in the universe, by everything in our lives. Our true nature is not separate from all the muck of our lives. We notice our anger, and we refrain from acting in anger. We notice that our partner needs us, and we go to our partner. If we're in Ukraine, perhaps we have the courage to fight or to stay and help the vulnerable. And then the Sangha, of course, is the community of fellow practitioners, this wonderful community that we're here together with this evening, fellow travelers on the way who have committed themselves to studying themselves, to generosity and to kindness, to saving all sentient beings. It's also our families, our co-workers, and the people on the subway around us. These things sustain us. In the words of Imad Araj, the love that you'll receive here, you are never ever going to see it anywhere else, right where you are. Sometimes we forget that the three treasures are always available to us. We sit, we enter Samadhi, but then something comes up and we're dissatisfied. I must not be sitting enough. Or I was sitting so much better yesterday, I should feel that way every time. Then I know I'll really got it. And there's a koan about this. It's always a koan, which is uh, case 10 in the Mumonkan. A monk asks, uh, named Seizi asks Sozan, Seizi is alone and poor. Will you give him support? And Sozan called out, Seizi. Seizi replied, yes, sir. And Sozan said, you have already finished three cups of the best wine in China. Why then do you say that you've not even wet your lips? 
So in this koan says he's studying with Master Sozon, who's one of the founders of the Soto school. And um, as a monk in the ninth century, uh, uh, in ninth century China, he probably was actually uh, very poor. Um, but here I think Seizi is speaking of spiritual poverty. He's speaking of those times when we just don't feel we get it. And he's searching and cannot find what he's looking for. We've all been there. We've all had moments of doubt. And Sozan apprehends Seizi's state of mind and he calls out to him, Seizi! Without a moment's hesitation, Seizi responds, yes, sir. How is he lacking? When he's called, he answers. When he's hungry, he eats. Life is as it should be. Sozan then speaks the turning words that allow Seizi to attain to his true nature. You've already finished three cups of the best wine in China. Why then do you say? You have not even wet your lips. And at these words, Seizi sees through his questioning minds. He sees through his doubts. He's found what he's searching for. He's completely free. There's actually a verse from the Shodoka that I wanted to read that uh, really touches on these same points. And we've covered some of these, uh, these verses uh, um, in our study text uh, over the last couple of months. The Shodaka says, we know that Shakya's sons and daughters are poor in body, but not in the Tao. In their poverty, they always wear ragged clothing, but they have the jewel of no price treasured within. This jewel of no price can never be used up though they spend it freely to help people they meet. Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya, and the four kinds of wisdom are all contained within. The eight kinds of emancipation, there it is again, freedom, and the six universal powers are all impressed on the ground of their mind. So our practice is dropping body and mind, giving up our attachments, seeing through our delusions. And occasionally, we realize that we have a precious jewel, that actually the three jewels of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. This is lasting freedom. So perhaps we, all of us here tonight, are the freedom convoy. We get up from our cushions and wherever we go, we embody freedom, we offer peace. <laughs>